so good to see you this morning. What a beautiful day out there, huh? It's amazing. Kind of reminds me of uh, just the beautiful couple of months we've had with the rain and the sunshine and, and, you know, rain and sunshine, that combination creates poppies and flowers, doesn't it? Yeah, see that behind me? I mean, there's just this whole kind of super duper bloom, right? Of poppies and uh, how many of you have been out there off of Walker Canyon, off the freeway? How many of you have driven by to look at the poppies? Okay. How many of you get out once in a while? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're not just there off the 15 freeway in Elsinore between Corona and or Lake Matthews on up through uh, to Elsinore and through Elsinore. But have you noticed the flowers all over? There's just a wide variety of them, obviously, from the rain and the sunshine. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of things kind of happening because of that. A lot of people are coming out here to, to, to uh, experience the super bloom. And because of that, there's just unfortunate things have taken place. I found an article in the Desert Sun that, that uh, identified a few of the problems with the super bloom. Not that there's any problems with it, but because of things that people have been countered. And um, this was about a week and a half ago, I got this article. It says, uh, so far, and it's probably bigger now, but six people, visitors, have been treated for injuries. Uh, according to Cal Fire, one person was hit by a falling rock, another passed out, and the rest, a lot of twisted ankles, they say. You know, people are pulling over and they're hiking back in the hills. It's just, I, I get it. It's so beautiful. Why, while you're hiking, there's unsteady ground and stepping on rocks and whatnot and slipping and whatnot. It's, just, it's, it's really magnificent. Um, but the Desert Sun article uh, went on to give us some helpful hints. And I thought, you needed that. So can I share that with you this morning? Here, here's six helpful hints. Number one, don't attempt, concerning going out, because I know all of you are going to rush over to Walker Canyon off the 15 freeway and go look at the poppies and the flowers and whatnot. Don't attempt to push that all-terrain baby stroller over the stream and up the side of the Walker Canyon mountain, hiking where you're not supposed to and loosening rocks and you cause boulders to tumble down. Your baby or your puppy, elderly parent, will be flattened by boulders. That's what the newspaper said. <laughs> Plus, you'll completely crush the poppies you came to photograph in the first place. Number two, they, they suggest that you stay hydrated, bring water. It, it's hot, and as you hike, you're going to get thirsty and need to be hydrated, and so don't forget to bring uh, water, not only for yourself, but for your dog and your children. These, that makes sense. Uh, number three, avoid hanger. <laughs> hanger. You heard it right. Hanger. To avoid killing your poppy hiking partner out of... <laughs> Hanger, that's when you're hungry and you get angry. That's hangry. You're hangry. Yeah. How, how many of you get a little irritable when you're hungry? Yeah. And how many of you get a little irritable when you pull over and there's 50 million people looking at flowers and you want to look at them? Yeah. And you're, and you're hungry. And you're hungry. That's hanger. Hanger. Um, number four, this makes so much sense. Protect your skin. Lather on the sunscreen and cover yourself. In bug spray, it's nature. There are bugs. I get it. Number five, I was a little confused. Dress appropriately. It says, pack that gauzy maxi dress in a backpack and change when you get to your photo spot. I think I get that, but it doesn't really apply to me. Um, you will, you'll trip over that dress and unnecessarily flash someone. That, it says it right here. I know you're not supposed to say everything that you read, but... It was in the newspaper, and it was on the internet, so you know it's true, right? Number six, number six, watch out for rattlesnakes. Now, listen, really, watch out for rattlesnakes, even around here. So they've had, so far, they've had two rattlesnake bites, and one was on a Saturday. It was a person on, on Saturday, and one was on a Sunday uh, a couple weeks back. And that was a dog, and they were both treated. And here's what the, and they're okay, they're okay, but here's what the newspaper reported. They said, and no rattlesnakes were harmed. <laughs> I, I'm sure that that makes you feel good, uh, that no rattlesnakes were harmed. Okay. 
But you know, when you think about that super balloon and you can kind of see the people on the screen behind me hiking and it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. It really is. Um, it's easy to get kind of ta taken in all the beauty and, and not really watch where you're going. Step on a rock, lose your footing, and you're not careful and you get hurt. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. This morning's message is called Walking Joyfully. And there's an art, there's a skill, there's a supernatural experience that you and I can tap into to walk joyfully. It's not an easy thing to do. Some, you know, there's always that odd person that's joyful all the time and, and you, you want to be around them because it just kind of get, that joy gets in you as well. But, but there's something about walking joyfully that's empowering and it empowers other people too. So Ephesians 5, 15 through 21 is the block of scripture that we're going to look at pretty much verse by verse. Verse 15 says, look carefully then how you walk. The apostle Paul, he's talking to the church in Ephesus. Therefore, he's talking to us and he's telling the church, he's telling believers, you and I, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, or for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Verse 20, it says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so Paul's giving us some instruction, I believe, that's connected with walking carefully. Walking, when he's talking about walking carefully, he's talking about your Christian walk, your, your testimony, your spiritual walk. Now, last week we ended with uh, chapter 5, verse 14. And I chose that verse for a memory verse. So on your memory verse card, it's in your bulletin. Go ahead and take that out. It's on the screen. This is verse 14, chapter 5. And it, it's fascinating that Paul even used the language that he's using because he's talking to Christians. And look what he says here. And this is last week. We ended with this. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul, he's addressing Christians, you and I. And he, and he says, he's basically saying, don't walk in your sleep. Wake up, open your eyes, and make the most of every day. Don't walk in your sleep. Wake up. Make the most of every day. And now we're in verses 15 through 21, and I want to break it down. Because I believe this is how we can make the most of each day. And number one is this, walking in wisdom. Walking in wisdom. When we first arrived here on this campus, by the way, this church, the history behind it, this is the, supposedly the oldest church in the Valley of Menifee. It's built in the 1950s, a Southern Baptist church. And over the years, it changed names. When Eagle Ridge got over here in 2002, we went through what you would probably refer to as an extreme makeover. We had a vision that God gave us, and we presented that vision to an artist, and the artist drew a drawing. And somewhere on the campus, on a, on a wall, there's a drawing. I think it's in the children's section. There, it's actually a painting of what the front of the church looks like. Now, this artist uh, painted that based on what a vision that we gave him of what, what we felt God was telling us to build here and do here. And so he painted that, but then from that painting, from that artist's rendering, we hired an architect to draw. And so there were a number of things that we did here on the exterior and the interior. The, build, the buildings were here. We just changed the aesthetics of it. And then we made the interior more practical for use for, for our children and whatnot. In the sanctuary as well, we enlarged that. But what we did from that artist rendering is we hired an architect. And the architect took that drawing and then, you know, of course, he took measurements and everything. And he began to draw and draft 
plans for us to do this extensive, or what I refer to as an extreme makeover. And, and our construction company, many of you know the Mitchells, Mitchell Construction, they came in here and they, they've done this for us. God blessed and used their talents. You know, it's interesting, God can use your talents to glorify the kingdom of God. And certainly God's kingdom was glorified because we have a ministry here that's grown and it continues to grow. But we, it started out with a vision, and then that vision, there were plans. And can you imagine if we would have just showed up one day and said, you know, let's do this, let's do that, and then just jumped on it and did it, no plans. Halfway through, we realized we didn't do it right, have to tear it down and redo it. We didn't have any plans. We didn't, we didn't consult with professionals. We didn't counsel with, with individuals who had walked the path before us and done it. Uh, and thank God we didn't do it that way. But a lot of times, that's what people do. They, they just go off haphazardly and they live their life and they're doing the best they can. And, and what Paul is saying here is he's saying, be careful when you walk. Be careful. Now, it's interesting the word that he uses, careful. In some of your um, translations, the, in, for instance, the King James and the New King James uses the word circumspectly. And, uh, and there's two Latin words that come from that, it, which mean looking around, looking around. And I've shared this before. In the martial arts world, um, the, one of the best moves that you can learn is a defensive move called situational awareness. Whether you're male or female, uh, tall or small, situ situational awareness is the best thing you can learn from the get-go. And, and, and that's just being aware of your surroundings. When you walk into a room or walk through a parking lot, just being aware of what's around you. And if you see things in the shadows and stuff, just being aware of those possible warning things. signs. Sometimes it, it calls for you to deviate your plan a little bit because the, the shadows are over here. Just situational awareness. Being aware of people you know, get it walking too close or walking up behind you and just kind of scanning and, and being aware. If, if anyone's in law enforcement here or has experience with that kind of stuff, you know, to, or military, a lot of times people that have that kind of experience, when they go into a restaurant, what do they do? They kind of sit in the corner so they could see everything, right? They could be aware. They usually don't like sitting out in the middle with their back to everybody. Situational awareness. It's ingrained in them. And... Uh, Paul is telling us to, to look around. To be, when he says to, to be careful in your walk, he, he, he's encouraging us. He's exhorting us to look around. And then the Greek word carries this idea. Check this out. The Greek word for circumspectly or, or to be careful is the idea of precision and accuracy. Precision and accuracy. Now, th think about this. That's looking, being aware, being careful with precision and accuracy. That, that takes a skill of thinking through things, doesn't it? it it's not reacting like that, but it's, it's responding appropriately. Now listen, I'm old school. I, I believe there's a difference between men and women. Okay, and, and this might offend some of you, but... They've, they've done studies on this. There are differences between men and women. And, um, and I don't say that sarcastically, but what I've witnessed and what science tells us is typically, generally speaking, women mature faster than men. Ladies, can I get an I amen? amen? Yeah. I mean, guys, we're a little bit behind the curve. Guys, do you agree with that? Yes. Say yes. It's a lot safer that way. Okay? <laughs> so what happens is... The way our brain is and the way God made us, we have a frontal cortex in the front. And I've shared this before in years past. But with males, the frontal cortex doesn't fully develop, generally speaking, because in some men it never develops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but generally speaking, it doesn't fully develop till a man is about 25, 26 years old or older, right? Women, it's far earlier. They mature faster than us. They just do, guys. And so the front, what does the frontal cortex do? The frontal cortex analyzes, looks at things, uh, it processes, it reasons, it, it considers the outcome. It, it looks at what could possibly be 
the residual effect of any decision. It's thinking past the action and what could be, the consequence. That's the word I'm looking for. It's looking and examining the consequence of any decision action. That's what the frontal cortex does. And, and Paul is saying, be careful. That, that's analyzing. That's looking around, precision, accuracy. See that you walk carefully with exactness. That, that's what it means. The opposite of walking carefully would be walking without proper foresight, walking foolishly. And so we have this exhortation for us as men and, and women of God to walk carefully. To walk carefully. Make wise decisions. Paul says, seek the will of God. Seek the will of God. And you might say, well, how do I do that? How do I seek the will of God? Get into God's Word. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's one of the reasons I'm motivated to do our Scripture memory verse. To print some things that you can take with you, that you can memorize and hand it off to someone else as an invite to church. But it's to, to become familiar with God's Word. You know, God's Word's powerful. God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke it into existence. When Jesus, after he was baptized, went into the wilderness and Satan himself tempted Jesus, Jesus didn't use any ninja skills or anything like that. Jesus fought the enemy with the Word of God. And so it's so important for us to, to get to know the Word of God. And, and getting to know the Word of God will reveal the will of God in our life. I mean, there are answers to everything in God's Word. And so spending time in God's Word creates the opportunity, let me say, to walk in wisdom. So we walk in wisdom as we walk carefully. And number two, walk with understanding that life is short. Life is short. It really is. Do you, do you realize that? In verse 16 of Ephesians 5, it says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, Paul is diagnosing that in his time, the days are evil. Make the best use of, of your time. This was written over 2,000 years ago, and certainly the days are even more evil now. Would you agree with that? And so the exhortation is to make the best use of your time as believers. And, and what would that mean? Well, the Greek word that's being used here translates into the English word opportunity, which conveys that thought of moving toward the port. It's a, it's a picture of a ship taking advantage of the wind and the tide to arrive to the harbor safely. And so there's a bit of strategy now involved. When we are making the most of our time, there's forethought in our walking as a believer. There's forethought to make the most of our time, to use wisdom in our walk, in our speech, in, in our actions. And Paul says to do so because the days are evil. And now in your notes, I have a, a passage from 1 Peter 4. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, it's right there in your notes, and it's on the church app. But I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I wanted to point out something. Peter says, Beloved, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And what Peter's saying is, believers, don't, don't be surprised when life doesn't go smooth, when, when a trial happens. It's, it, that's life. That's what's going to happen. And there's a teaching that's going on. It's been going on for years. There's nothing new under the sun that says when you're a Christian, everything's going to go smooth and rosy. And that's just not the case. I mean, church history tells us just the opposite. Followers of Jesus, Jesus said himself from his own lips, he said, if you choose to abide in me, if, in other words, if you choose to follow the teachings of Jesus, Jesus said, if you choose to, to abide in me, you will suffer Tribulation. Tribulations is, that word means a pressing in. It's pressure. It's, they're not fun times. And so Peter is saying here, don't be surprised 
or feel it's strange when, when those kinds of things are happening to you. And then he goes on to say that there's a, there's a connection between what Christ suffered and our suffering if it's done in a way that glorifies God. And so you may be going, and well, I bring this up because you may be going through a difficult time right now. We all do, periodically. And you might be thinking that uh, God has taken his hand off of your life. Or he's not being as attentive to you right now. And yet when we go through difficult times, they're difficult times. And we have to learn from those. And God still loves us. He's there. It might be a little foggy where exactly he is, but trust me and trust God. He is there. He is there to get you through that and, and to encourage you and to, to bring you to a place where you need to be. Tap into God's will. So we walk in wisdom, we understand life is short, and then number three, we tap into the will of God. Verse 17 of Ephesians 5 says this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. A few months back, I shared with you the, the dynamic that takes place growing up, and we all have a different reference point. We all have different history and experiences. We do. And, and, and those things impact our life. They, in many respects, form who we are. And it creates, creates within us filters. And I've talked about this many times because these are the things that we wrestle with. And so when we see something and we perceive something or we're in a situation and we think something or we react, many times, and I would boldly say most of the time, it goes through that filter. And, and I'll challenge you right now and say that that filter that you have and how you react to things and how you think and perceive and the assumptions that you make Sometimes they're not right. They're not right. But they're based on who you are, and the who you are is based on life's experiences, right? There's a problem with that as a believer. Because if our assumptions, our perception, our reaction doesn't glorify God, and it's not right, and it's based on a foundation that's not truth, then something needs to change. Here's the beauty of God's love for us. Look with me at Romans chapter 12. It's in your notes. I don't have it on the screen. The first two verses, Paul, the author of Romans, I believe, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, he, I beseech you, some of your translations say, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, I want to stop there because I, I think Romans chapter 12, verse 1 correlates beautifully with verse 15 of Ephesians 5, where Paul says, walk carefully. And he says in Romans to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's an act of worship to live a life that desires to please God and glorify God. But he doesn't stop there. Look at verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me read that again. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing. How, how, do, how, how can you and I be transformed in our thinking? We love Jesus, but we have this tendency to go to the default and look at things, react to things based on our experiences. And if that's not right, and if it's warped, if it's crooked, if it's not pure truth, then our mind needs to be changed. And the only way to do that is if it's transformed. And how can it be transformed? 
It's transformed when it's renewed. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so vitally important that you and I get into the Word of God, spend time with the Lord in prayer and worship, and the Holy Spirit takes the truth of God's Word and transforms our mind. And so our perceptions, our assumptions, our behavior, you could call it reactions or responses, are, are in better alignment with God's truth and guidance when our minds are transformed and renewed by the Spirit of God. Transformation is a result of the Word of God getting into us. Prayer and worship. Someone say amen. We desperately need that area of our walk to be transformed. Amen? And so I want to ask you a question that you can ask yourself. If God saved me and he has a purpose for my life, then I should discover that purpose and then guide my life, do everything that I can do to live my life accordingly. If you and I are saved, our desire should be to walk in that salvation, to have our mind transformed and renewed, to live a life that's not conformed to the world, to be careful in our walk. And then I'll conclude with this. Paul gets down to some nitty-gritty stuff, as he always does. And he does it very well. In verse 18 of chapter 5 of Ephesians, he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is a debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. What Paul's saying there is don't do things that become such a distraction that you can't think with clarity. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. Don't be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember during the Jesus movement, that's when I received Christ. It's from the late 60s to the early 70s, mid-70s, the Jesus movement. And in time, you'll see in history books that that will be considered one of the great awakenings or revivals in the United States. And to be a part of that is a real special thing. But I remember that, uh, you know, it was during the, the hippie days, right, 60s and the 70s. And, um, and I remember that clearly. And one of the things that I would hear is there's no better high than Jesus. Because that was in the day and age of drugs and, and things. And, you know, there's no better high than, than Jesus. But, you know, there's so much truth to that. There's nothing. And I hate to even... Put it, package it in that kind of verbiage, but that's what was going on during the Jesus movement. But in reality, there's nothing better than Jesus. And then in verse 19, Paul says, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. I can't help but think that that might be uh, included in that would be, you know, speaking life. Speaking to people in such a manner that it not only brings glory to God, but it encourages that individual. It's so easy to go south with negativity and be critical, but to speak to, ch to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, that's, that's a, it's a it, beautiful place to be, a sweet worship unto the Lord. And then giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting, this is what we have a hard time with, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Just being a servant. Christians are servants. If you want to be great, I mean, all through our life we've been told, hey, you know, rise to the top, do, do this, do that, get all you can. 
I mean, we see that in all the commercials and everything. But if you want to be great in God's economy, in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all.